first is Dr. Aditya Bharatwaj. Uh, Dr. Aditya, you can come and uh, come on the dais. And Aditya is from Amritsar. He's come all the way here, and he's going to tell us about conservative management of proximal humerus fractures. We have second speaker, Dr. Harpal Singh. Uh, sir, you can also come on stage. Uh, sir is from Ludhiana. Then, uh, obviously, Dr. Anupagarwal is there live with us. He is going to speak on proximal humerus uh, phyllos uh, uh, plating. Then we have uh, uh, role of intramedullary nails, uh, which Dr. Silesh Pai is going to talk to us. Dr. Silesh, you can also take the stage. Then, obviously, Dr. Dip is there with me. Uh, Dipit, come. So, Dipit and me are going to talk from here, and uh, one by one, the speakers will come. They will talk about the topic. And then later we are going to have case discussions. So where we want to make it absolutely interactive because it's not, it shouldn't be one way. Then uh, uh, we have Dr. Praveen. Dr. Praveen, please come. Dr. Praveen is with me at Cyan Hospital and uh, he's a uh, big help to me. So he's going to throw some light on literature review. So whatever we're going to talk here, whatever opinions we are going to give here, Dr. Praveen is going to back up everything as per what literature says. So let's start with the first talk. Uh, the opening batsman is Dr. Aditya Bharatwaj. So please come. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be talking on the conservative management of proximal humerus fracture. To just begin with, we all know it's more common in females than males, and it has a bimodal distribution. Young males being more affected with the high velocity traumas, while I've Older females are the ones with the trivial trauma. Uh, osteoporosis is the main leading cause. It's the third most common non-vertebral osteoporotic fractures. And what we are more concerned or the dilemma is about the older females osteoporotic and how to manage proximal humerus fracture in these. So you all know it has four parts. Well, the supraspinatus displaces the greater tuberosity superiorly and posteriorly. The subscap uh, displaces the lesser tuberosity medially, the pectoralis major displaces the humeral shaft medially and interiorly, and the deltoid displaces the humeral shaft proximally. So we have to create a balance among these deforming forces to have a good result with a conservative management. So for me, the proximal humerus fractures have completed the 360 degree circle. To begin with, everybody said, uh, used to conserve these fractures, but nobody liked the x-rays, the malunited proximal humerus fractures, and we shifted to percutaneous fixation, which Dr. Harpal will be telling us. But then they had their own complication of pin tract infections, and then came the fill loss. We loved these x-rays, and we thought this is the Ramban for the proximal humerus. But then, wrongly indicated, we started seeing this. The fill loss started to fail in certain cases. Then came the nails, the multi-directional locking nails, and we th thought these will be the answers, but nails failed too. And then finally we thought, let's re start replacing these in older mills be because of the fail high failure rates. But then lately in the last few years, again, we are focusing on, we can conserve a few and start cons conservatively manage these proximal humerus fractures. So mostly, most fractures can be managed, because there is certain data says, this is not all consensus, but 80% can be conserved. And the indications are very clear. It's older age where the demand is low and the patient is unfit for surgery. Uh, if the fracture is st uh, stable clinically and radiologically where there's interdigitation of the fragments or there's impaction, valgus impacted two or three parts fractures can be conserved. The protocol is you can use a sling, a sling with an abduction pillow, a shoulder immobilizer and few uh, papers from Japan are uh, focusing on uh, conserving these in a neutral rotation to have a balance in the deforming forces. Placement of a pad in the axilla helps in aligning that shaft which has gone medially to the rest of the fracture fragments. So weekly uh, uh, radiographs are first two weeks to have a close follow-up, bi-weekly till six weeks and the final at three months for the consolidation. After two to three weeks, we can start passive range of motion exercises, better tolerated in supine position, then start with quadman pendulum exercises, active assisted at six weeks, abduction we generally start at eight weeks, and then strengthening by three months. Early active assisted motion is the key with pendulum exercises, which leads to good range of motion and good functional results, even though the x-ray looks bad 
uh, with Mal Union. Coming to literature, Dr. Praveen will be talking uh, us through in detail, but this was a proffer trial in 2015 which showed, concluded that there's no significant difference between surgical and non-surgical uh, modalities, but, uh, and do not support the increased trend of surgery in proximal humerus fractures. But then proffer trial had its own controversies. 87 uh, patients had clear indication of surgeries but were not included in the studies. 16 out of 125 were random, uh, randomized to surgery but did not receive surgery. And there were 66 surgeons involved. So it, it has its own controversies. Uh, hemi and reverse were not included in these. But regardless, this trial uh, supports non-operative management in selected patients. The complications are malunion, though all malunions are not symptomatic, non-unions and AVN. AVN, a minor head, uh, humeral head collapse is often tolerated with minimal symptoms, but for it, any case, all the three complications, major complications, we have arthroplasty as a backup or a salvage procedure. But to go to is like replacement is better after a failed conservative than a failed open reduction and internal fixation. Though it is still debatable that to do a replacement in acute or a late stage. With, I think the cases will be discussed. Yes. We'll, take yeah, we, we'll, we'll just take the second talk now because all the questions and all will be discussed later. So I invite Dr. Harpal Singh. He is going to speak on uh, CC screws and percutaneous spinning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I've been given the task to talk about K-wire fixation and screws. And uh, this has a big part of our clinical practice for proximal humerus. So I'll be talking from my experience and uh, my colleagues' experience. We are a group of people who do this. And uh, I'm not going to talk much about the literature because literature review will be taken up later. And second, the literature available from the Western countries is, I was just discussing with uh, Dr. Praveen, it's old. Nothing new is coming up because it makes no sense to bring out, reinvent the wheel first, second, uh, there are a lot of issues in the Western countries with certain things which do not make sense in India. Like if patient has to visit three times for a dressing in a Western country, that's a big negative impact. And our Indian patient would be ready to come for three follow-ups without any issues. So what does the surgeon need? You need to know the anatomy of the proximal humerus and anatomy of the fracture. You should be able to make, preferably a beach chair position. We started with supine with a support under the scapula. But if you have beach chair position, it makes your life very easy, especially the manipulation of the fragments. You need a good image intensifier and a knowledge how to use the image intensifier in the shoulder. What we used to take, when to take, and how to position your CM. And we all do that pre-operatively and mark on the floor that this is the position of the CM which is going to work for me in this case. Two simple instruments are required. One is a periosteum elevator and one is a hook. And that's all we use to achieve our reductions in these patients. And <coughs> use 1.8 mm K wires. Don't try to use 1.5. They're not going to work. 2 mm are not flexible enough. In some, I'll mark out in some positions, 2 mm will work. In rest, it is 1.8 which does the trick. So, the same again, the Kapanji palm tree, it comes from the wrist. It's a palm tree technique. Three divergent wires, three points of fixation. They spread out in the head of the humerus. You need to drill a cortical hole in the lateral wall to push your wires in. Push them. They are not drilled. They are actually pushed. After bent, you push them up. It's like something like a tense nail. And it provides an angular and uh, rotational stability. Right? But all these patients will stay in a brace because if they rotate repeatedly, these wires are going to cut through or they will go loose. Are they sharp or they are blunt? Some of them are sharp, some of them are blunt. So it's suited for a fresh fracture, especially an isolated injury. If it's a thin patient, 
low energy trauma, this is to begin with. Once you become more experienced, you can go ahead and do it in many kind of patients. <coughs> Geriatric fractures, majority of the injuries, except when it's a dislocation. Don't try it in a dislocation, it won't work. Patient has to be cooperative. And young patient, if it's a simple configuration, you can try it. In young patients, function will be different and is more important. So try to achieve the best function in a young patient. And I wouldn't suggest, I, I don't say we never do it, but I would prefer to go in for a better fixation device in young patients who are active. So it allows collapse, more biological, minimal blood loss, requires less armamentarium and less costly. Biology preservation is very important. You know, the surgical trauma to the shoulder is the, is the main culprit for stiffness after surgery. And it's easy. So challenges, just to show you a few cases, this is the kind of pre-op we had. This is what I was able to achieve. This is the after removal, and this is the function in an elderly patient. She's 67. Another patient, again, a four-part, he's young. Slowly over a period of time, we have started taking chances, united, and this is the uh, result. I'm not saying I'll achieve this result in every patient. Right? Another 70-year-old obese, good reduction. We were able to achieve a good anatomical reduction, and this is the kind of function. Right? The, they will have some soft tissue components, so it's not possible to guarantee them. We always tell them, I can give you 90 degrees of abduction, and we don't promise more. If they really require more, I'll go for an open reduction and plating. That's an honest confession. So close reduction in K-wire, useful weapon in a surgeon's armamentarium, you must know it, has several advantages over plate fixation, especially in elderly patients. Good patient selection will give you good results. This is not for every patient. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we have online, uh, Dr. Anu Bagrawal will be joining us on Zoom. Uh, can, the, can the AV guys connect him? Yeah. So, Hello everyone, is my screen visible now? Uh, uh, it's a, just wait for a minute. Yeah, yeah, it's available. It's, it's, a, it's, it's there, sir. You can start. Okay. So, okay, I'll be speaking on uh, proximal humerus fractures, how to fix them and the keys to success. So, there's some important facts uh, which you should know how to reduce them, how to fix this tuberosities and what is it importance, how to place the plate and screw properly, what's the significance of calcar screw and is medial augmentation required or not. So, if you compare is my screen visible properly or there is an issue? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. We can see. Okay. Thank you. So, if there are two pictures, one is of intertrochantic fracture, another is proximal humerus. So, if you compare the intertrochantic fracture with proximal humerus, you will find a lot of similarities. So, what you have is in this, you have a greater tuberosity, you have a head fragment, you have a lesser tuberosity and then you have a shaft with medial column or the medial comminution or medial stability. So, if you compare these two, they have a lot of similarities and this is what is you required. These are the four fragments which you need to reduce actually and you need to know, understand the anatomy of it that where they actually go. So, we by Adit had already told that how the fracture fragments are being pulled by the different muscles. But what is more important to understand the head, though it does not have any muscle attachment, but normally it goes posteriorly and inferiorly. So with this knowledge that how these fragments are placed or displaced, the first aim is to reduce the head. If out of these four fragments, first aim is reduce the head, bring back the tuberosities, lesser and greater tuberosities. And then align all these fragments to the shaft. 
Now, when I say alignment, it is the head shaft angle which is needed to be aligned well and we need to align the medial stability, the medial combination or the medial cortex. Why it is important? It has been very well established that maintaining the head shaft, uh, head neck shaft angle induces the lack of medial support and it has a prognostic factor that can lead to a poor outcome if it has not been maintained. So that is our aim to achieve. Now how to do that? So if you have a virus fracture, then you have to reduce foot head either by putting a K wire then manipulate or you can put an periosteum inside the fracture and then reduce back or you can use the suture wire and then put back the head. A word about where to put your retractors most of the time what we see uh, since it is in the head in the virus we try to put your retractor or some instrument onto the medial side of the head to push it back. Never ever try to do that because that's the only vascular supply to head which is remained. So if you have to push any fragment any uh, your finger or any instrument it has to be through the a rotator cuff interval from where you can push back. So that is how you do the virus reduction for valgus. It's much simpler to reduce a valgus fracture. You just put a periosteal elevator inside the fracture fragment, reduce it. Once you have reduced the head part, now next target would be suture back the greater tuberosity, pull it. from the posterior of the tuberosities I suture them together along with the head so this makes one fragment head lesser uh, trochant, uh, lesser tuberosity and greater tuberosity in one fragment and then you can see in this picture then I align it to the shaft so this avoids the placement of lot of K wires and then you can place your plate well there are no hindrance of the K wire so once you have done now the most important aspect is that medial reduction that is aligning your proximal fragment to the shaft. We all know that philos can be used as a reduction tool but if you have a virus collapse in that case if you are putting first screw into the shaft it will further push the head it won't reduce. So what you need to do is you need to first put the screw at certain angle depending upon the amount of uh, uh, displacement into head and then adduct the plate to the shaft and then put the shaft screw that is how you will be able to reduce in virus while in a valgus fracture if you are putting your first screw into the shaft it will reduce the valgus fragment into its position. So the trick to use the phyllos or the plate as a reduction tool is different for virus or a valgus fracture this is how you do it in valgus. Once you have done all that I again put my sutures back into the holes which are there into the plate then align my plate and put on a zig and then I place all my screw. Now what about where you should put your plate? Your plate should be 20-30 degree angled and lateral to the bicipital group and it should be uh, distal to the tip of tuberosity. What about cautious that never use the most proximal hole and put K wire to align your plate. Always align your plate with the zig. If you are doing it with the K wire into plate you will always be wrong. And align your plate in both lateral and AP. Once you have done the alignment pass your screw. Always check your screws in all position. A word about TAD like in intertrochantric you have 5 to 10 but here in proximal fracture you have to be as close as possible to the articular surface but never ever penetrate the articular surface, keep on rotating and checking on different uh, view about the penetration of particular surface of the screw. A word about calcar screw, the n number of studies Dr. Praveen would be giving you the data about this that loss of medial support is the most common reason for secondary displacement and that's the reason all these studies have proven that having a calcar screw further strengthen the uh, medial stability and how you place whether everybody needs a calcar screw no if you don't have a medial combination and if you have a medial continuity probably you don't require like in this case but if you have a medial combination then you will require a calcar screw.
and even after a calcar screw you find don't find it is stable then probably you will need some of the osteobiologics like bone graft or fibula strut or iliac crest graft or if it's not available then you can use the bone graft substitute and there are n number of studies which have proven that adding these biologics add to the strength and um, union of these fractures so rehabilitation depends on type and quality of fixation associated injury and patient compliance so i'll conclude by quoting this study that a majority of displaced fractures treated conservatively with early physical therapy treatment for displaced fracture should be dependent on the patient's level of independence bone quality surgical risk factors fixation with percutaneous technique intramedullary nail locking plate and arthroplasty all are acceptable treatment options mind it there is no clear cut evidence based treatment of choice for every patient so you need to consider your own comfort level your skill patient condition to decide and in having a decision making thank you thank you sir thank you very much for coming online and uh, we will continue with our talks dr sailesh pai is the next speaker he is going to speak on intramedullary nails for uh, proximal humerus fractures what do you sir so my job was to speak about intramedullary nails and i was given 3 minutes for that so whenever we speak about implants uh, for treating anything couple of questions come number 1 how to do it number 2 when can we do it and number 3 of course we would like to know what literature says so literature will be shown by dr pravin so my the first part of how to do it we have covered that in the workshop uh, last many of you were there and so today i just thought we will just show some cases of when can we do it and take questions so that we have more time for discussion so number 1 uh, i have kept two part out three and four parts all the complex situations that we can think of here is a four part fracture so as long as we could get a good reduction good valgus reduction get the tuberous radius back which is the key factor we could nail it union is not much of a concern the patient should be doing good elderly gentleman posterior dislocation neglected 70 year old six weeks presentation again same principles reduce them get the tuberous radius back and fix them with the nail nail should do good union is not again a concern and once it unites and the tuberous radius are back range of movement should be near normal head split fracture i'm pretty sure all of you agree that it's one of the most toughest uh, sub type of a fracture in the proximal humerus to treat no matter what age this is a pure head split in a young gentleman again same principles reduce it in valgus get the tuberous radius back the nail will do the job that's him immediate post op at union that's his range of movements i have his consent for showing his face in the video this is a head split in mid 30 year old gentleman software engineer by profession segmental fracture there is one more other uh, fracture which is little tough to treat uh, with a plate or most other devices uh, again with a nail we do not bother about what's happening to the shaft all is all we need to do is get a good reduction in the head once the nail goes into the distal part of the shaft the alignment is more or less uh, by itself so this was again a four part fracture in the proximal humerus very well easily be treatable with a nail that's him it is union and the range of movements anatomical neck fracture in elderly uh, again concern because anatomical neck uh, it's little tough to do this with a plate so many of us start considering whether we need to replace it we get ct scans and see that the uh, percentage of bone is less than 30% 25 15 sometime but remember that ct scan does not give us all the information that is why if you can see the head is not just rotated it is tilted so when the scans are taken scans are taken at fixed definitions so maybe at that particular position we we are seeing only some uh, small part of the head but the entire head is actually there unless it is a head split or head fragmented fracture all the head is there that was the what the head the patient had all these years so we can't be uh, thinking that it's it's the head is not there because it's not an open fracture there can't be a bone loss so anatomical neck fractures again much easier to do it with a nail uh, get the red valgus reduction get the tuberosity is back good entry and we could do it with a nail much easily that's at union so the last case i'll be showing with significantly comminuted fractures what do we do in them again uh, we all know as long as the biology is preserved union should not be a challenge so neck shaft angle get the neck shaft angle well tuberosity is well this was a open fracture nail them healing should happen luckily thankfully whatever you want to call that but since the biology is preserved union should be there and that's the range of movement so take home messages 
we all know nails are significantly biomechanical advantage over most other uh, fixation device in, in, in proximal humerus. Uh, to take off all the uh, mind blocks from our head, it could be done in all subtypes of fracture, no matter what we're talking of, two, three, four feet dislocation without combination, anatomical necks, segmentals, head splits, everything. Mm -hmm. Learning curve actually not that steep. Once we have done enough femur nailings and we all know how to do them, humeral nailing is much more easier. So it's not that steep. So I think we should all be considering them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sailesh. One, only one important point which I want to ask you, uh, you can take the mic. Uh, the cases that you showed, are you taking a uh, rotator cuff uh, suture through the uh, displaced thing or you are just putting the nail inside and expecting the tuberosity to sit back? Tuberosity won't sit back. We need to get the tuberosity back. We need back. to take a suture through the, through the thing, the tuberosities. That's Our next speaker is Dr. Dipit Sau. He is going to teach us about how to do a good reverse shoulder for proximal humerus fractures. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to all the audiences. Now, I'll be speaking on reverse shoulder, but uh, let me start off by saying that this is less than 10% of the proximal humerus fractures that are replaced in my practice. Most of them can be conserved or plated. Reverse shoulder, even though I'm speaking about it, will be showing you good results, but they are very small part where, where fixation is not possible. Even conservative may lead to bad results. And when to do it, why and how to do it, I'll give you three indications where you should do it. Um, and all those indications are, are, are examples where you cannot probably conserve them and probably cannot plate them, at least I cannot plate them and give good results. So this is one. So head is dislocated in an elderly individual. There is no soft tissue attached mostly. And if you see, I cannot get the head back to the glenoid without stripping the soft tissue. There are some times in a dislocated fracture where I can, in this one, this is too far displaced and dislocated, I cannot um, um, bring it back. So this is one classic example where I would uh, do a reverse shoulder, not hemi, I'll tell you why. Second is, it's just badly comminuted. It's just five, six part fracture. It's just so many fragments, head is split. It is, it is, a, it is a very futile exercise. You go on fixing each and every fragment. You can conserve with bad results, but uh, fixation is bad. So probably these ones also, I'll just do a reverse. And reverse shoulder gives um, excellent outcome, that is, a, that is a proven thing. Now, and this is the third, also one of the few first cases uh, when I started doing reverse and fractures, what the sequelae of failures, non-unions, philos failures, malunion, avians, all sequelae of philos failures. Um, so, uh, for example, in this case, it's, the head is gone, the screws are going in, there is small, there, is, there was a non-union at the neck level. So, this one also cannot be uh, salvaged by any other methods. And HEMI is not my go-to procedure. I've stopped doing HEMI for the last few years. So I always, if there, it has to be replaced, it has to be reversed. HEMI is a bad option, just doesn't give good results in most cases. There's a less likelihood. So these are the three, uh, and this is another sequelae, a non-union, a, a, a one-year non-union, which uh, uh, was not amenable to any other treatment, and we just did a reverse, and they get acceptable functions even in these, although it's the second time you're operating. The second time you operate in a shoulder is never good. It will give you inferior results, the movements are less, fibrosis is more. But then, even then, reverse, is, reverse still gives some acceptable um, uh, movements. If you see, ROMs are always good in reverse. Um, not always, if you can say most of the time they are. So indications three, always remember these. Head has less likelihood of survival, badly, just badly com communicated and sequelae. Now, why not hemi and why reverse? This is a good question. Hemi has just fallen in disfavor. Most of the shoulder surgeons do not prefer it. I just don't prefer it. I just don't do it in last few years. If you see, this is a hemi which was, had a badly comminuted, my own case, my own failure. Badly comminuted GT, tried to reconstruct it. Post-op date looks okay. Six months later, if you see the head has gone up, hitting the acromion is complete failure. The GT mostly whenever there is comminuted just doesn't unite, just doesn't heal to the shaft. The GT has to heal to the shaft. It doesn't heal to the uh, prosthesis has to heal to the shaft, it doesn't, it doesn't heal. Even a good looking x-ray fails more chances of failure later on. So hemi, probably not a good choice. Now, I'll just show you this. So if you see in the first x-ray, we did, a, I did a very good GT reconstruction in the reverse. The GT did not unite. Even in a reverse, it did not unite. So it may not unite even in a reverse, but the reverse doesn't care. Reverse doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if the GT unites or not. It will, it will have a good function because it only needs a delta. Delta is functioning. GT unite, doesn't unite. LT unite, doesn't unite. It doesn't matter. You will have a good function irrespective of the GT healing. Not so the case with HEMI. 
Now three technical aspects I will just give you. Um, again three, lucky number three. So always remember three points. So three technical aspects why when you are doing a reverse in fractures. Couple of things to take care. Now the humeral stem is the most concerning thing and three things are most critical. How much to keep in, how much to keep proud, retroversion and GT reconstruction. Glenoid base plate is very standard mostly. If you do a reverse it's just like that. So how much to sink in, how much to keep proud. We published this cadaveric study with Dr. Jairam. If you see 53 millimeter was the average distance from the pec major upper part of tendon, the humeral head is 53 millimeter. We, this is a published study by us. So 53 millimeter, you, the metal part of the, the humeral tray should be kept superior to the pec major tendon, 53, 53 millimeter. So this is a land, uh, approximate landmark that you can always uh, rely, I sometimes rely on if I don't have a, a mashed x-ray from the normal side. Now how much to do a retroversion? So again, you don't have landmarks, metaphysis is broken, GT broken, everything in the proximal part is broken. How much do you do a retroversion? Normally we do a retroversion in the normal retroversion of the patient. The patient retroversion is not possible here if you don't have an opposite side CT scan. So 25 degrees is, a no, is an average retroversion that uh, uh, we have found in our study, published study again. So 25 to 30 millimeter is average retroversion of human Indian pop Indian population. So that is a ballpark figure and you don't know the person's, uh, this patient's retroversion. I keep around 25 to 30 because that is what is an average Indian female or male will have. So I keep, tend to keep around 25, 30. And the GT repair, the if you know the designs, the 135 or 145 is better than the older 155 angled processes of reverse. They allow a better tuberosity reconstruction. Now even then they may fail, but we do it still in the beginning to give some soft tissue support. So uh, summary, uh, just if you can keep in mind, the technique of humeral implantation is important, how much to sink in. Functional outcome will be excellent if you keep in those points in mind and reverse is any day preferred than hemi now in elderly patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dipit. Our last speaker is Dr. Praveen. He will back up all the talks with uh, review of the literature. Uh, Dr. Praveen, you can come over. And last, I think we'll take the questions or maybe we'll take some cases. So whatever the audience wants, you know, because we'll be left only with five minutes. So good afternoon, all. Uh, so um, now I am starting with the review of literature after all these talks. So in all these talks, the classification which was followed is the NIRS classification. So let's revisit what is the NIRS classification. This was the uh, uh, article which was published in 1970 by Dr. Charles Neal. It clearly mentions that it is a displaced fracture which matters. Number of fracture line does not matter if the fragments are not displaced. Uh, this is a uh, review of your conservative treatment for proximal numerous. Uh, this is a proffer trial uh, that uh, Anup Agrawal sir just uh, discussed. So proffer trial, it was a, it was a randomized control study between the <coughs> surgical and non-surgical treatments. So 250 patients were enrolled for it and they were followed for uh, two years. Since it was a randomized control study, it has had a high level of incidence. But if we delve deeper into this trial, it just mentioned whether it was a tuberosity involvement or not. It does not mention how much separation was there. It does not mention whether it was a two-part fracture or three-part fractures. <laughs> then this is a conservative treatment uh, systematic review published in uh, 2020. Uh, it was from PubMed and Cochrane databases uh, for last 20 years. It shows that three-part fracture has good functional results where the four-part fracture with conservative treatment, they show the poor functional results. So, the phyllos is a go-to treatment for most of your proximal humerus fracture, for most of us. But still, phyllos, we face some failure rates. So, we try to, try to analyze whether there was any uh, inherent uh, fracture patterns which leads to this. So, this is the article published in 2009 in Journal of orthopedic trauma, which shows the various angulation at the time of presentation has a poor outcome. And if it is metafacial segment of two millimeters attached to the articular fragment, the chances of avian are less. So similar study was done in 2016 in Journal of Injury. 
uh, it shows that initial virus has poor prognosis. The f uh, they studied 101 fractures for nearly one year. The 14 patients need reoperation, and three patients needed conversion to arthroplasty. And all the patients who had a virus alignment at presentation, they uh, they needed arth uh, conversion to arthroplasty. So the importance of the medial support in the locking plates means it has been uh, very well described uh, in this article, in article from 2007. The 35 patients, they were followed up to the fracture healing. They, they define medial support. If the medial cortex is anatomically reduced or if there is an inferior medial screw in the proximal fragment through phyllos. So they found out that if the medial support is absent, there is a reduction is lost while during follow-up. So this is a recent study in 2018. So they try to find out which type of fixation is better, whether it is inferior medial screw is better or whether the, any structural allografts, they will be having a greater impact. So this study, they studied about around 164 patients. Uh, they class classified, uh, uh, they distributed like this, like 80 uh, patients were treated by inferior medial screw and 84 patients uh, they treated with the fibular allograph. And 164 patients all had a combination on the medial side. So they found out that ki these four part fractures where the allograph was used, allograph was useful in these patients. Uh, means functional outcomes in three part fractures uh, with the fibula allograph and inferior medial screw was normal. Like in the functional outcomes in the four part fractures with uh, inferior medial screw was lower than their fibula allograph. So coming to the literature review of Nils, so we stumbled across this book, Simple and Complex Fractures of the Fumerus. It was published in uh, 2015. And this chapter, the intramedullary nail for the proximal humerus fracture, old concept revisited. Uh, this author, according to author, this the la older proximal humerus nail, they had a lateral entry point. This lead to the greater tuberosity uh, fractures and for the complications. So this author advocated a medial entry point and smaller short diameter nails. So this is the example of the older uh, nails, which is having a broad diameter, which used to get locked up distally and which leads to the non-union. This, this author further describes the hip fractures and the shoulder fractures are not equivalent. The, in shoulder fracture, there is a horizontal pulling force. If we follow the classic AO teaching, the direction of our screws has to be perpendicular to the fracture. Now, the fracture line between tuberosity is at here. So the screw direction has to be perpendicular to this and not like this. So can we use nail in all fracture types? So uh, this was studied in 2015. Uh, they, this was a review article. They studied after 14 studies with 448 patients. They found out that reoperation rate was higher in four part fracture, which was done with nailing. Can we do nailing in all fracture types? So, uh, this was studied further in 2015 in uh, European Journal of uh, Traumatology. They classified, they improvised the uh, uh, NIRS classification, and according to uh, they classified it as a, whether it is articular involvement, whether there is a surgical neck involvement, whether there is a tuberosity was involved. And they found out that the displaced articular fracture, this is the A3 type, they needed arthroplasty. This is for the last study on the nail in all fracture types. So here they found out that functional outcome was similar in three and four part fracture which are treated by nails. But these authors emphasize the quality of reduction has a strong influence on incidence of post-operative or vascular necrosis. If you are not able to get a reduction by nailing, you have to change your surgery. So can we, so with, these are studies which compare nailing with plating and they found out there was a no significant difference between nailing and plating. But yes, nailing is, has a less blood loss, less operation time. This is a study 
uh, in 2015, uh, which found out that if there is a medial hinge at the time of presentation, then functional scores are better with plating. Uh, then finally, this review of literature of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty in, pro in uh, proximal humerus fracture. Uh, the functional outcomes are good at the one year and uh, complication rates are less. This is another study from 2017. It shows that with reverse shoulder arthroplasty at one year follow-up, 91% of patients, they reach the pre-trauma independence level and they don't have to take a higher doses of analgesics for pain control. And finally, this is a study in 2017. Here, the patients, they compared the patient who have been advised the reverse shoulder arthroplasty with the patient who are undergone reverse shoulder arthroplasty. At, at one year follow-up, they didn't find any difference between range of motion and patient reported outcomes. So, literature for reverse shoulder arthroplasty is still developing. We have to wait, uh, we have to uh, wait for the further literature. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Praveen. I think uh, we are just reaching time. So, I think we'll discuss the questions, you know, from the audience. You can ask the questions to the esteemed faculty here. Because we had lined up some four cases, but I think because of shortage of time, I think it's better we take questions so that, you know, you can clear your doubts. Yeah, Ravi. Hi. Uh, Dipit, one question for you. You already said a redo surgery in shoulder is going to be fraught with yeah. uh, its own problems. So, when you are opting for re-operation, say, planning to do a reverse shoulder, do you do a EMG to see the status of the axillary nerve? Because many a times, first surgery you may not have done, somebody else may have done, there is significant damage at times and you are hinging, your whole reverse shoulder depends on a functioning deltoid. A very good question, has been in my mind every time I go in for a revision surgery and some of them, for example, I did one case, I agree with you that anterior deltoid was gone, only posterior deltoid was left, they don't get good movements. So clinical judgment of uh, deltoid is what I rely on now. So the power, they won't be able to abduct, but I do check the power, atrophy and all that. EMG, NCV have not done, but if he has, I mean, I don't operate at least one year has passed after loss failures or something. So if you, have, if you have a good muscle mass still and is able to contract like an abduction power is okay, I will do it. And I have had a failure once which did not have a deltoid. It was completely gone because of the first surgery, axillary was gone. So that is a concern always to check a axillary deltoid power. I, I agree with you. Yeah, this question is to all the faculty. There are a lot of controversies about different people talking about ideal number of screws in the proximal fragment in phyllos plating. So what is actually the ideal number of screws one should have? Because some people say three is sufficient, some people say five is sufficient and stuff like that. So. So everybody I, can take a take, yeah. Take so I'll tell you what I so I have this has been my question for last few years and I started with five six went down to three four and I've done all those three screws four screws five and six screws also and I looked up the literature there's no real clinical literature telling us ki you should do six screws or five screws AO says four to five screws that's what the AO manual says now clinical evidence is not there and I have done many cases with three screws only. Uh, and if because I rely more on the cuff sutures going through the plate. So angular stability, angular stability is we, I achieve by the cuff sutures tied to the plate. So that is what I rely on more. But I, I can, we can go through each one of them. So the I, would, the I would say it's the reduction which is going to hold your construct rather than the plate. Second, depends on the bone quality. Third, how good is your spread with the screws? If your screws are well spread into the head, three may do. But when you are putting in the screws, I want to know the other side, Dipit, I want to know the other side, what's the harm in putting a fourth or a fifth screw? Yes. So the harm, as I have seen in my cases, 25% of screw removal because of screw going in, because if there is a mild collapse also. I have seen couple of uh, patients, I have removed the screws. So that is the only hardware. More hardware, more chances of complication. That is the only thing. For in my practice, uh, the main is the calcar screw. If I am getting yeah. a calcar screw and then the two divergent screws, they are the main three screws I am focusing on. I might add ad additional two convergent screws if I feel that the uh, bone quality is not that good. But that five is the limit for me. But the most important is the calcar and the two divergent screws which hold the spread of the uh, 
can i take a yes. uh, my question is how important is pre operative ct scan to know more in osteoporotic fractures where there might be a void and you might be required to fill in with augments and uh, again that number of screws so we'll start I think it's almost 100% of the time, at least in our uh, situation, we need to be doing CT scan. If you are thinking of doing in three and four part fractures, definitely in elderly. More than the void, what we are actually concerned is number one, head split. Number two, the pseudo splits. Many times the lesser tuberosity takes a part of the head and also the greater tuberosity takes a part of the head. In these cases, we need to be able to, I mean, tackle them better. So also, uh, 2D CT more important than 3D because we will know how much uh, uh, real uh, quality of bone is there. So, Almost 100% of the time, we'll be getting a CT scan. Uh, One question to Dr. Singh. Very simple. You have shown um, beautiful slides with uh, 1.8 or 2 mm K wares. My simple suggestion is uh, threaded K wares are better to avoid uh, proximal migration, which is Sir, very a very frequent problem. Threaded while putting through the soft tissue can be a very big problem, and we have had muscles. We were lucky, no neurovascular structure got caught. And even while removal, it can be a very big problem. Yeah, but what about the proximal migration of the uh, K-wares, money, especially? Sir, ideally, the first wire is a sharp wire. Rest of the wires can be cut and then put through like a tense nail. I will say we have had a wires which have cut through the head, but when you mobilize, you remove mm. and mobilize, it doesn't affect the result. I, I think we'll have, to, we'll have to wind up this session because we, the next session is supposed to start in another three minutes. Thank you very much, faculty. Thank you, chairmen, for uh, chairing this session. And uh, my co-convener, Dr. Deeper, thank you very much. The faculty is going to be available outside during the tea break, so you can ask them whatever questions you all have because we have to give over this hall to the next uh, session. So I hope you understand my situation. Thank you so much. So, good afternoon, and we are all set to start with a session on to neglected foot and ankle trauma, is salvage possible? And uh, can I have my presentation? Okay. Who is there from organizing team? Can we have the presentation here? Yeah, they are putting, putting up. No, it's senior, it's not. Okay. So the learning objective of this session is discuss the unique clinical scenario in neglected foot and ankle cases, outline management options with a specific focus on the salvaging the joints. Yes, we know that fusions can always be done, but we are trying to talk about the salvage. We need to highlight finer details of management, including timing, details of procedure, choice of implant and approach, and steps to avoid and treat complications. So for this, we have our esteemed panelist, Dr. Asim Negi from Indore. He is a renowned trauma and reconstructive surgeon, interested into management of complex trauma and non-unions. He is also a national faculty for AO, 
and has had presentation at various state and national conferences. We have Abhishek Kini, who is a consultant foot and ankle reconstruction surgeon with special interest into sports medicine. He is attached to Hinduja Hospital, Reliance Hospital, Jupiter, Lilavati, Bridge Candy. Uh, Doc Negi, if you could come and have a say. Abhishek would be joining us in a minute. We have Dr. Rahul, he is a consultant foot and ankle surgeon from Rajasthan Hospital, executive committee member of Indian Foot and Ankle Society and Sikot Foot and Ankle Society. And he is a founder, Jaipur Foot and Ankle Society member. Unfortunately, he could not make it. So we're just going to go through his presentation. And we have Dr. Girish Motwani, who is a specialist foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon from Nagpur. And he has been executive committee member of Indian Foot and Ankle Society and is carrying a very big responsibility of organizing Indian Foot and Ankle Society's annual conference for 2020. Giris, can you please come up on the dais? And uh, I am Rajiv Shah. I am foot and ankle surgeon from Baroda, immediate past chairman of Asia Pacific Foot and Ankle Council and past president of Indian Foot and Ankle Society. So with this small introduction, Let's start ball rolling. What we'll do, we all would turn by turn present a case of neglected foot and ankle trauma and we'll come up with how did we manage it. And then we will leave it to floor to ask questions, to bombard questions to any of the panelists. So here comes the first uh, speaker, Dr. Asim Negi. He is going to talk about neglected ankle fracture management. Over to you. Can I have the first slide? Please make it slide show. Yeah. Thank you. This 41-year-old lady who is a software engineer working from home in Hyderabad, she had a fall at home and at the peak of COVID was treated by some osteopath, some splintage and other things. And four months down the line, this is her X-ray. Another two months passed by before she sought treatment because pain was increasing and she wasn't able to manage her activities. This is the stage I saw her. We got an X-ray of the opposite normal ankle done so that we know the parameters which we have to restore. Friends, remember that the ankle mortise is like a ring and ring has to be reconstituted for regaining stability. Remember that normal parameters of the ankle joint. The time sign has to be restored by restoring the length of the fibula. On the AP view, as you can see here, distal tibial fibular overlap has to be more than six millimeter and you should have equal horizontal and medial clear spaces as shown by the arrow on that AP view. On the mortise view, tibial fibular clear space should be less than five millimeter. That's the normal. So this is what we are striving to achieve. In this patient, fibula is short anteriorly angulated as you can see here and it's small rotated. So these are the three things we have to correct in the fibula. These are the sagittal and coronal images there. Medial mellus is a very tiny piece. Talus has shifted laterally and is tilted also. Fortunately for me and the patient, posterior malleolar fragment was there but it has united in good position and the syndesmotic notch doesn't look really bad. We operated the patient under a spinal scissor in the supine position. There is a bump under the hip, tourniquet. I have marked the incision for my anterolateral orthotromy for open reduction of syndesmosis if I finally need it. I marked the posterolateral incision, but we started with a smaller medial incision because unless you clear this medial gutter, you cannot bring back the talus there. There is no space at six months. It is all filled up with fibrous tissue. With the help of uh, thin periosteum and the artery forcep, the medial mellus has to be demarcated under image intensifier control. It's not easy at six to seven months to even find out where the medial mellus is. We located it, then we took a flexible osteotome, thin flexible osteotome and osteotomized to open the non-union site. Please remove all the fibrous tissue from the medial gutter to make place for the talus to come in. Then a long posterolateral incision, perona have been retracted posteriorly, we, knife can cut through the fibrous tissue in the non-union site and recreate the original fracture again using a thin osteotome as we have done here. 
freshen the fracture ends, open medullary canal on both the sides, lever out fibula to length as much as is possible without using a distractor first, reduce and clamp a 10 hole 3.5 locking plate there and fix the distal fragment with K wires. At times if the distal fragment is short then your distal K wire fragment you can pin it to the talus even so that the fibular length whatever is normal you want to restore it is fixed. Fibula you can see that is stitched short by few millimeters. So you complete the fixation of the distal fragment. In this patient, we chose to pass a 2.7 millimeter cortical screw in the proximal fragment closer to the fracture site in a combi hole, which is fairly long, 7, 8 millimeters is there, but not fully tightened. This screw will ensure that a fibula is lengthened along the desired axis, and then we pass another screw proximal to the plate and use a cervical interbody distractor, like the picture is shown in the picture, and regain those few six, 5, 6 millimeters. If I needed more length to achieve, then probably I'll have to back out that 2.7 screw, complete the proximal fixation and then pass a syndesmatic screw or a guide wire and bar out the close medial wall, malleolus non-union site. You will have to clear out the fibrous tissue, remove extra bone medially on the proximal fragment, pass a joystick in the medial malleolus because it's a tiny fragment, it's difficult to hold it. Periosteum in the medial gutter is pushing it so that central line can be restored. Pass K wires perpendicular to the fracture plane. Here the plane is distal anterior to proximal posterior. Tension went completed. This is her immediate post-op. At two weeks, she has got a fairly good range, no plaster. Six weeks, three months, and this is her two years follow-up. She is back to her normal. She can run, she can dance. That's her gait. So key points here. To remember our attempt a reconstruction of a malunited ankle except in cases with significant severe arthritis. Minor arthritis, please reconstruct the ankle. It will last at least 10 years for that patient. And restore the fibular length and rotation. At times you will have to use a tricortical strut there, restore talus in mortis, correct tilt, fix medial malleus and the posterior malleus if required, reduce and fix the syndesmosis at times with open reduction and all this in old cases will require extensive soft tissue release and clearance of the medial gutter. So don't shy away. Thank you. As I said, we'll take uh, questions on to every case once we finish the discussion. So I'm going to talk on to uh, Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. Presentation. Click on to the presentation, please. Okay, this is what I need to do. Okay, so neglected Dallas injuries. I'm going to talk about three different case scenarios. All adult patients, almost of the same age group and all either neglected, untreated, or poorly treated talus injuries. A five months old, neglected, untreated trauma, treated by a quack, and these are the CT scan pictures. There's a sagittal image, comes like this, and it's a non-union, or the malunion, whatever you call it, it is just five months old injury of body of the talus. This is the case number two, three months old, neglected, poorly managed trauma, where one or two K wires were passed and the whole uh, comminuted medial half of the Taylor body was lying like that. This was the situation at the end of three months when he was sent to us, that's the skin condition. And this is how it was, a uh, fracture neck talus plus lost medial half of the Taylor body. Another case, 18 months old, neglected, poorly treated trauma, medial malleolar osteotomy was done, posterior anterior screws were passed for fracture neck talus. And these are his clinical pictures. You look at his foot, there is cavus, there is varus, there is equinus. And so this three similar situation, uh, untreated neck body fracture, a treated fracture, poorly treated fracture, and again poorly treated fracture with 
some arthrosis malunion and then question is is salvage possible in this cases otherwise we traditionally know that such malunions they go into tibio talo calcaneal fusion so let's see how we salvage all three cases the decision making for neglected talus injury is the age activity of the patient duration of the malunion what is the status of the joint and whether avascular necrosis is there or not some little points of low significance are deformity status of the soft tissues quality of the bone and comorbidities and the salvage options could be revision fixation revision fixation plus osteotomy partial or total talar allograft replacement and very recent is total talus replacement so case one five months old neglected fracture double approach was taken and this is how the picture looked this is the fracture line it was opened up with a sharp osteotome and fragments were mobilized and ultimately the fixation was done and this was the on table fixation that went on to unite without any avascular necrosis and these are the movements of this patient that the case number 2 3 months old compound lost medial half of talar body with fracture neck fever neck talus so debridement vac external fixator was done in stage 1 antibiotic impregnated cement spacer for the lost medial half of the talar body was done expix was removed at the end of 6 weeks parameters serological parameters were good allograft talus was procured of a reasonable same age obviously not the same size and ankle salvage was aimed at where the matching of the half of the allografts was done with that of the remaining talus at the level of the ankle joint it was fixed and neck of the talus was also fixed and grafted this is how it went on to union and this is the function of that patient at the end of one and a half years in the last case 18 months old malunion with ankle and subtalar arthritis ct scan of the opposite side was done 3d printed file was created and three models plus and minus 1 plus 0 were created with an anterior approach talectomy was done and implantation of the 3d printed uh, total talus was done this were the online on table movements and some additional procedure in form of tendo achilles strengthening uh, 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 lateral sliding calcaneal cal cal osteotomy hammer to correction of the great toe and plantar fascia release was done and this is the result of this patient where total talus replacement was done these are his movements and he is back to his normal activity thank you very much uh, Please come on the dais, sir. He is also one of the candidates. Sir, please, yeah, sir, please come. Good afternoon, everyone. Post lunch session. Thank you for being here. so i'm going to be talking about calcaneum fract fractures neglected so um, the reason neglected is like we see a lot of them neglected and that's the importance so importance of calcaneum fractures being an intraarticular fracture it's important that if we should or other if we don't neglect a tibial plateau then why neglect a calcaneum which is also a weight bearing intraarticular fracture mm -hmm. assess the deformity and act appropriately so this is the case of a 24 year old male had a fall 9 weeks back Uh, was treated in a slab for four weeks and then a compression bandage for the following three weeks. Is an office goer. He travels from Badlapur to VT to go to work and was told that eventually you'll have pain and then let's see how things go. So at this stage with this deformity and fracture, uh, how many would offer a 
refix to this, just a show of hands. One, two, maybe three, uh, four or five. Okay. Uh, I think CT will come to that also. So even if say like the CT is bad, but still I think there are less uh, courageful people over here than uh, the remaining. So again, the case, again, it's an intra-articular fracture. You see that the main fragment is depressed. You see a deformity that's quite a significant varus. Yes, the question is cartilage. At nine weeks in a 24-year-old man, would you consider like burning the cartilage down and offering him a direct fusion or something? Because he's not able to travel now. So I did an open reduction. I got the lateral wall down. We elevated the fragment. Yes, CT didn't play. There was a video of that. So CT on CT, in fact, he also had an MRI, which showed that the cartilage was relatively well preserved. Like the sub, for me, the subchondral bone on the cartilage of the cartilage is very important. If it shows rarefaction, I am skeptical of the cartilage. So it's like an indirect indicator for me. So in this guy, yes, we consented everything. We elevated, held it with a K wire. We corrected the virus and we fixed it. Yes, in drop, I've kept one wire there to go right through the subtalar joint. So this is what it looked immediate post-op. You see there is disuse osteopenia right now. Eventually at one year, this is the picture. He's resuming all his office duties of going, uh, coming in a local train in a Mumbai traffic and is able to do most of his stuff comfortably. So this is a case where we attempted a refixation for this deformity of calcaneum at nine weeks. So by the time he came on table was nine and a half, ten weeks and went ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kini. Uh, Kini. Uh, the next topic is salvage of neglected metatarsal fracture. As Dr. Rahul Upadha is not there, Dr. Rajiv Shah will take over. Thank you. So it's a case of Dr. Rahul who could not manage to come. Uh, 22 years old young male had a pain in the right foot and difficulty in walking with a plantar callosity and he had a history of road traffic accident. You can see the plantar callosity and thickening and it was like uh, mal united third and fourth metatarsal with an angulation showing a plantar flex metatarsal. And this is the maestro's line which shows that this metatarsal is quite short. And please, sh please shut off the alarm. We are, we are taking less time than what we are given. And this is how the transverse parabolic arch of the foot was, uh, you know, lost. And so the options for him were condylectomy, resection of metatarsal head, or salvage with osteotomy and deformity correction. So mind you, what we are trying to show here are all those foot and ankle fractures which can be salvaged, malunited or neglected. So Dr. Rahul wanted to go ahead with salvage. So he opened it up with a... Uh, incision and then this was the dorsal bum that was the head of the metatarsal and then a dorsal close wedge osteotomy was done fixed with a K wire and this was the final picture where you see that the plantar flex metatarsal is corrected and this patient went back to his routine activity. So take home message is dorsiflexin metatarsal osteotomy is a good salvage measure for neglected metatarsal fracture. Intractable plantar keratosis need treatment of the root cause because the cause is the pressure of the metatarsal. Master's lines are excellent guide to assess the abnormal metatarsal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajiv, sir. Uh, thank you, Team Vairog, for inviting me for this esteemed conference. So my job is to talk about is the salvage possible for the Lisfranc injury. So uh, 
he is a 35 year old male uh, he had a history of trauma due to fall from stairs went to a local physician uh, got an x-ray found that there is nothing on the x-rays and he has been treated with the simple crab bandage but he has a pain and the swelling all around the midfoot and these were the location of pain and the swelling 15 days post injury when uh, he had a con uh, continuous pain and the same swelling, no improvement. So he went to a, another surgeon uh, where these weight bearing x-rays were done and it was found that there is something problematic at the base of second metatarsal. But still the injury was not cleared. He started walking on the deformed foot and developed this kind of deformity after 45 days. And uh, these were the full weight bearing x-rays showing clear cut instability of the tarsometatarsal joints may be at the level of cuneiform also with the dorsal subluxation of metatarsal. I mean a whole package of a radiologically evaluated Lisfranc injury. This is what has been done at the other center saying that it is just a six weeks the deformity is flexible. It has moved too much so it is flexible and this is what has been done. With the percutaneous K-wire fixation without opening the joint and this was the radiological parameters which were where we assess whether the reduction of the Lisfranc is acceptable or not. And it is clear in the audience that it is not acceptable. So now it is two months old injury. He came to us, we removed the K-wire, we got done CT scan and the CT scan was showing that these are the level of comminution, some dorsal subluxation clear uh, diastasis between first and the second metatarsal uh, comminution at the base of second metatarsal. We got an MRI also because he's a young champ. So we wanted to know whether the cartilage status is good or not. And these are the area of, you know, the subchondral changes which has been developed at the end of two months. Maybe some man manipulations by multiple manipulations by the k uh, has increased more injury level to this cartilage at the end of two months. So he has been planned for the uh, uh, for the uh, for the fusion because uh, this uh, this was really a non salvageable uh, at the end of two months because of these kind of uh, changes in the CT and the MRI and uh, look at the uh, foot level this was abducted and uh, instability was assessed intraoperatively because it was two months and we we achieved that there is a lot of instability. Uh, I mean a kind of flexible instability was still present uh, on intraoperative situation and this was the diastasis level. TMT joint instability, this is called piano key sign was still present at the two months and this is the dorsal subluxation of the second metatarsal. Intercuniform instability was still there between medial and the middle cuneiform and they were moving like a chunk. And there were a lot of fibrosis between the tar tarsometatarsal joint and the intercuniform joint which was taken out. Cartilage was removed which was visible and was really bad. Locking plates were applied in intention to the fusion. Some synthetic bone graft were also used to bridge that small gap. This is how the closure has been done. This is a functional outcome showing a good range of motion of the ankle. Toe movements, they were full. Talonavicular joints, chopper joints were full. Eight weeks follow-up, good fusion, uh, pain-free movements, walking, full weight bearing, six months, good consolidation of the TMT joints, eight months, plantigrade foot, walking, full weight bearing. So for the missed and the maltreated Liz Frank injury, conclusion is we cannot salvage them. Sometimes it's a very poor option of... of of, of salvaging those bad TMT joints. Fusion is a viable option. Meticulous joint preparation is important. Plan for some defects and the bone graft because it's a old injuries and rigid reconstruction is important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Girish. Yeah, at the end, I would just request, sorry, can you please show the last slide? Yeah, it's outside. I would request that next year Indian Foot and Ankle Society conference, annual conference, we are going to organize in Nagpur and you are heartily welcome. The registration link is open on the website. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you can ask questions to the speakers. So we had talked about salvage of neglected ankle, that of calcaneus, that of talus, that of metatarsal and less frank we said that it is not salvageable if it is. So you can address your question to anyone 
out of us you feel ah same ji sir uh, you have put a syndesmotic screw uh, is there a criteria for putting that in a neglected uh, bimalleolar or trimalleolar fracture where you yourself in a ct scan have said the mortise is looking good i will agree the probably it wasn't required okay yeah. if uh, Agreed. No. they can open your presentation on slide 2 can i answer this yes question? yes yeah. sir in a neglected case even if syndesmosis is good well aligned i like to put in one or two trans or fibula pro tibia screw that augments the stability of the fixation so if i happen to be on his place i would have put in two minimum two fibula pro tibia screws to augment the stability so i feel that fixation is been helped by your screw asim hold on i am justifying uh, in the intra op cm pictures if they can open out uh, the criteria what you have laid down the tibio fibular space is more than 5 mm 4 okay yeah. no the uh, true mortise view on the cm intra op slide number 2 or 3 which you have shown yeah uh, so which suggest there is a instability one second the medial clear space is more than obviously 4 or 5 mm the whole construct has uh, no, shifted no no that yeah. i agree yeah so now these are two criteria on which we can say there is a syndesmotic injury and the ct scan the fibula is in the incisura or maybe a millimeter more it has yeah, widened it in good out. position yeah so how do we decide that very often we have a situation while all of us are fixing a trimalleolar fracture where Uh, the fibular fracture is above the syndesmosis there is a posterior malleolus which is very small which falls back in position and there is not and when you check the dorsiflexion view there is the medial clear space is normal so how do you decide on table whether in those situations you need a syndesmotic fixation even the smaller ones as a religion um, something like 10% also a posterior malleolus i do an open reduction so i have stabilized that uh, quite often in a fresh case having fixed all three components of the injury i don't use anything no syndesmotic no no my question he, is not here it's different here i see my question is not that after having fixed the fibula after having fixed the medial malleolus and the posterior the posterior malleolus is a too small a fragment right or you uh, on table you do a dorsiflexion the ankle is stable the mortise is stable do you still feel when the injury is above the syndesmosis the fibular injury is above the if syndesmosis if in doubt i will i will put it you should so, stress all no, your fixations yeah, in no no the uh, doubt i am saying sagittal axon rotation i am giving a explanation yeah. there is no doubt in after the fixation the medial clear space is normal as good as the other side okay the tibio fibular space is normal and still you have a small fragment of posterior malleolus Sa sangeet we are still... repeating the same thing if there is a gray area i will play it safe and put the, put screw. the screws i okay. can always take okay. it out i agree yeah so there will be gray areas but if i am 100% confident having fixed all three components almost 80% of the times i don't use a syndesmotic screw because i'm very sure yeah, yeah. yeah. if i so, doubt i'll put it dr negi if you have fixed everything and your syndesmotic fixation is also very good you have done everything properly still your mortise is not anatomic what could be the reason i will go back to my uh, original planning probably i have goofed up somewhere and if required i will take that anterior lateral orthotomy for the syndesmosis open that area see it either my fibula is mal rotated or is short a few millimeters more than in a fresh case that is the only thing because posteriorly i always take a posterior lateral approach uh, even 10% pmf i fix open reduce and fix it yeah yeah mason's classification tells us that yeah. smaller the fragment more is the chances because there is an attachment it's, of pitf yeah. but more in the same but my question was yeah. that if you have fixed everything very nicely your length restored rotation restored and still you feel hmm. that your mortise is not anatomic so, so, there could so, be two so, situations so something in interposing there there could be two situation yeah. deltoid that integrity is lost or 
ATFL, anterior talofibrillar ligament, is not in, uh -huh. it is lax. So these two things, when you feel that you've done everything and still it is not falling into place, look for these two things. They could be going haywire. And you might as well require to go in and do reconstruction of the deltoid or reconstruction of ATFL. You are talking about a medial malleolar fracture with a deltoid incompetence or uh, it is not there? Yeah. Even with the stalwart, stalwart yeah. in his article showed yeah. that even if you have a medial malleolar fracture, still, it can be. still there could be a deltoid be inco in incompetence. In so the message is stress your ankle fracture in three at planes. every level. Yeah. You fix one, stress. You fix second, stress. And AITFL, I will choose to open it. It's hardly a five minutes job. You just see it and uh, put it back and put a, a screw with a washer. I would put in a yeah. scope and do it. Right. Yeah. Please. Dr. Nagy, you showed yes. a two-year follow-up, please. Still, you're having that uh, centimeter screw. What is the protocol of your She syndrome? has not turned up. She has to be invited. Please come for a free consultation and an X-ray. Oh, so she refused. She was. So anyway, she is not from Indore. She is from uh, Hyderabad. So, what is the protocol about the cinnamon screw when you remove? Uh, I explained to the patient that it may break. If uh, recently there was a patient, I discussed with him also, and patient was doing kuku ko. So, after four months, I would like to remove it. Not at eight weeks or ten weeks. If it's troubling him, otherwise, as a rule, I don't encourage them to come for a removal. So, I this lady is happy. She has not asked for a removal. Actually, I bribed her. <laughs> no fee, free x-ray, everything. Please come and <laughs> show me. <laughs> By and large, if the patient is not getting ankle dorsiflexion at the end of four months of your good fixation, I feel that I need to go in and I remove my syndesmetic screw because you might have over tightened it. That otherwise, let it break. Sir, uh, when you are pulling out the fibula to the length, uh, how do you assess the rotation of the talus within the mortise? Do you do it before you put the screws in the proximal fibula? And uh, uh, because uh, if you fix the fibula slightly anterior or slightly posterior, the talus oh. will be rotated in or oh. out. And I oh. find it very difficult oh. to assess. Open, open reduce the syndesmotic part. Either by taking a slightly atypical incision, J-type, where you can use the same incision, or if you have gone way posteriorly, then you take a small anterolateral orthotomy, separate too. Or some people, they like a single incision which exposes the fibula and that anterior part of the syndesmosis. Both. Rajiv Bhai likes to put an uh, uh, anterior K-wire so that it doesn't... Yeah. So I, I, I put in... One K wire which will fix my syndesmotic temporary K wire. Temporarily, and I'll put a K wire which is flush to the anterior border of the fibula. So my screw is going from posterolateral to anteromedial. I don't want my fibula to slide. And you see the this plane mobility is more instability in a in a sagittal, sagittal plane is more than the mediolateral plane. That's why I do this. Plus length you tend to lose so if you have lengthened the fibula, you just from the distal part of the fibula, you pass a wire, transfixing wire in the talus, which you can remove afterwards. Otherwise, you will lengthen it, and finally, you may end up with a short fibula. Abhishek, <clears throat> uh, were you happy with the reduction? The last x-ray, the axial view, shows a significant step. The wall, uh, the displacement is not completely corrected. Uh, no, the medial uh, step you meant? Sir? Yeah, I, uh, that actual view, the last picture we, what you have shown, there is a significant step. Is it acceptable in that 24-year-old? Uh, so when we moved it, that was a gap that was there. So on the medial wall, because of the varus tilt, when I got it to length and corrected the alignment. Uh, it was, uh, Girish, it was on the opposite side of the plate. Uh, that's the medial uh, side. That's, yeah, medial side. Yeah, that, that yeah. step which was there in the pre-op x-ray as well. Correct. So, so you have not been able to… Uh, no, sir, it was not an intra-articular step. It wasn't, it wasn't an intra… it was on the wall. Okay. It was okay. on the medial wall that… Because okay. I got it corrected. Right. Uh, Abhishek, uh, 
how often have you noted that in spite of and more so in such cases right in spite of getting a good reduction on table you have some virus at the end of and at the end of few weeks when you see your x-ray more so when you compare it with the opposite side correct so uh, i have learnt it by my experience so this time i had put one wire holding onto the talus so there are papers this kind of philosophy is also seen in an hto that's why on the lateral side they part they pass one axial screw to hold it and make it like a bicolumnar fixation so in calcaneums when i'm doing a refix or a revision or something i pass one axial screw only up to the subarticular facet on the medial side to prevent this medial collapse in future yeah so typically i have believed that it is like a bicondylar tibia fracture your plate is on a lateral side is probably not enough, enough to really you know take virus into the proper position so even if i am doing a fresh calcaneus or i am doing mis calcaneus or revision calcaneus i almost always put a fully threaded screw just flush to the medial border of the calcaneus so sir, which prevents the virus abhishek uh, it wasn't only virus at 3 months the tendoachylis is also That's sort of sh shortened so how could you bring that out to length so i was prepared for a fractional lengthening but because i had got my angles which i expected to achieve on table i didn't do it but otherwise that is one of the first steps that you need to do to get it down and proper calcaneal pitch you have done that and if in that struggle because the time consuming and surgery which is not easy so if it completely ruptures then it doesn't make a difference it does definitely because it's a percutaneously no i don't do it percutaneously do so it i do it open then it's fine always sorry so uh, my question is a continuation of the syndesmotic uh, discussion that we are having so if it is a cotton's fracture the posterior malleolus is a big chunk and uh, what is the fir firstly what is the steps of fixation posterior first lateral second and medial or lateral first posterior second and this and once i have reduced the posterior malleolus anatomically the fracture is at the level of the syndesmosis then do i need to put in a syndesmotic screw which is a little higher because otherwise that uh, syndesmotic screw goes very close to the fracture site so then it hampers in the healing of the lateral malleolus so what is your uh, first thing yes once posterior malleolus has to be fixed your approach is decided you are going by posterior lateral approach yes. okay you have to see the posterior malleolus and like a volar barton at the wrist you have to meta do a metaphyseal reduction okay. usually with a thumb pressure up to 2 weeks it will come and then i take a 2 mm k wire and under image intensifier which is in the lateral position it's a floppy lateral type of position i do i don't do them prone so under image intensifier just subcondyl 5 mm above the articular surface i shoot that wire and i keep in mind that i'm going to put a t plate there so it's in the meat of that then i reduce my fibula hold it with k wires or clamps but i don't put my plate on the fibula okay because that will hamper my radiology of the posterior malleolus but i reduce it hold it with at least one or two clamps and one or two k wires which at times i shoot and bring them out anteriorly if they are hampering my uh, operation then i slide a plate t plate uh, distal radius plate over that and it's a 3.5 plate is not a rigid locking plate which has got a shape which easily molds and will contour and act as an anti glide plate then i pass by metaphyseal screw okay Sir. proximal no, cortical yes for the uh, that right. thing there is already a wire holding it i pass another out of the three holes i pass one more hole k wire only and i am holding my posterior malleolus with the clamp in the plate hole so my plate doesn't become the plate stays flush there are two wires holding the posterior malleolus reduction fibula is already reduced then i pass my anti glide metaphyseal screw and substitute these two k wires with and then i go on the and then release the tunica achieve hemostasis close that wound and turn the patient supine Okay. Yeah, that will be. And how about the syndesmotic? Most thing, 
it's not necessary to pass it two centimeter above. You can pass it higher up also. Every ankle fixation has to be stressed in AP, lateral, and a coronal, sagittal, and with external rotation force. All ankles. And if there is something going wrong, even so, the ankle has subluxated after fixing everything. So even if we uh, fix the posterior malleolus, we would still add a syndesmotic screw? Mo most of the time I don't. Most of the time you don't? Okay. But I am very cruel in assessing the stability. Thank you. Last question, please. Question for Dr. Rajiv Shah. Uh, you said about uh, total teller replacement. You said one size up and one side down, you usually keep it on table. And what metal do you use for total teller? This is medical grade titanium. Titanium. Medical okay. grade titanium. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any question? Okay. We close this session. Thank you very much. We have 10 more minutes, you can have a, grab a cup of coffee or something and we start at 3.40.